up to find another day of a spotlight talk we are very excited to have uh, you as well as our speaker uh, mohammad kasem from the university of oxford uh, before we go to the talk and introduce our speaker i just give a brief background of myself and a uh, i'm pichak and i'm a phd student at the university of massachusetts and i am a stream owner in the machine learning and climate uh, uh, stream and i'll be trying to bring talks uh, in about papers uh, that have uh, that bring that bring out interesting ideas in this area to uh, the community and hopefully you will you know join us for this session and the future sessions as well so is is a um a community is it an online uh, machine learning uh, community around practitioners and researchers a uh, gathered around topics in ai research engineering and products we host three live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce content in various subject areas or uh, you can go on the es website uh, and and access these slides uh, make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel uh, and uh, ml papers explain to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish um so with that i will now introduce our speaker for this uh, for this talk today uh, mohammad kasem is a post doctoral research assistant in the department of physics university of oxford in the uk he has broad in research interest mainly in applying advanced computational techniques to solve problems in physics he received his phd in plasma physics from the university of oxford in 2017 his work has consistently been published in top journals such as physics review nature group journals among others and has been featured in popular magazines such as science and on blogs by nvidia mohammed also has spoken at top machine learning conferences most recently uh, including at uh, iclear 2020 uh, and and uh, we were, we are very excited to have mohammed with with us uh, today uh, mohammed uh, take it away hi thank you for the very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me in this talk so i'm going to give a presentation or talk about our work in building the high fidelity emulators with deep emulator network search so you can see the full paper on the archive that is linked below in this in this slide and this is a result of a collaboration from four institutions mostly from oxford there is also from rochester uh, sophia university and yale university and this is a multidisciplinary collaboration within oxford itself there is there are someone from physics and also from our science department so the background of the background motivation of this research is because we mostly work on simulations so i work in plasma physics and 90% of my time is doing simulation running simulations analyzing the simulation results and, and changing parameters of the simulations etc that's my daily work so when i read about machine learning or and deep learning i'm start thinking of how to integrate this machine learning into simulations and then i realized that this has wide applications among among physics itself and all over the science uh science disciplines so for example if you if you are a chemist or if you are a quantum physicist you mostly do simulations of atoms and electrons of quantum systems to see the energy and configuration and structure etc you use simulations to do, to work for that and also in astrophysics they use a lot of simulations in order to know what actually happens in systems outside in the outer space because we have no other means in observing them so we use simulations to help us knowing and understanding the universe and also in my field we use simulations but extensively in designing and understanding what happens in the implosion of the in, in the implosion of uh, fusion capsules so most of the simulation some of the simulation is very easy and very quick to run but most of the interesting simulation unfortunately is very expensive and very hard to work with 
So one of my simulations, I, when I did my PhD, actually took like 24 hours in supercomputer and it's very expensive. It's actually a bottleneck of our work because more than half of our time just wasted uh, for waiting for the simulation to end, uh, to finish. And in one of our simulation example in this work is atmospheric simulation where they simulate the dynamics of atmospheres and simulate the observation, the simulated observation. It took us, it took, it took us like 1,004 hours to finish this one simulation. So we can run a couple simulations, but if you want to know, if you want to find the fit, parameter fit, knowing the observations, we need to run the simulations hundreds to thousands of times and it's almost impossible to do it because one simulation takes like 1,000 core hours unless you have like very big supercomputer it's basically to run it like multiple times hundreds or thousand times and in most cases we run simulations not once but we needed to run like hundreds to thousands of times so this is the background of our research we need an emulator to speed it up while not sacrifice been quite a lot of research in emulator in building emulator so here are two examples from one from quantum chemistry and the other one from astrophysics in quantum chemistry the simulation is very expensive so they can they can only run simulations with uh, thousands of atoms but in that work, they built an emulator to substitute the most expensive part in that simulation so that so that they can run simulation with much, much more than 1,000 atoms. And on the right-hand side, they use... Uh, this is a work from Cosmic MU where they built an emulator to predict the output of cosmological parameters. So they generate the power spectra. So you input the cosmological parameters and they generate the power spectra from the emulator. So there has been quite a lot of work about emulator. And the challenge in building emulator is generally, I found the challenge in building emulator is generally these three factors. So the main objective in building the emulator is that the emulator cannot have low, low, much lower accuracy than the simulation itself. It will make the emulator useless if the accuracy is uh, very low. So there is no point in speeding it up if your emulator is wrong. And the second point is typically the simulation that we work to build emulator is slow simulations because fast simulation doesn't need emulator. It's already fast. You don't need to speed it up. So because it's slow, you cannot generate like hundreds of thousands or probably you can't even generate like tens of thousands or maybe thousands is very, is quite expensive for your simulation. So we need to work with small data sets. So we have to avoid overfitting and make the best use of the data that's generated. And also, the simulations that we have, uh, if you're given a simulation and you haven't run it at, you haven't run it for hundreds of time, you don't know what level of complexities of that uh, simulation. So if it's much more complex, then you tend to have, uh, then you tend to have much more complex emulator, but if it's, if your simulation is simpler, simple, it's not complex, then having complex architecture of your emulator would tend to overfit. So we need to find the right architecture to adjust with the complexity. So the idea of this work is we use the deep neural architecture search to train and find the right architecture of deep neural network that satisfies all the three previous conditions. So this is the this is the super architecture that you can see in this slide. 
and we restrict our work to simulations that takes n scalar inputs and output uh, some channels of 1D, 2D, or three-dimensional output. So it starts with n dimensional. Uh, it starts with n dimensional scalars, scalar values, with some fully connected layers. And then, so this is pretty standard. The first two layers are pretty standard, and then the rest, the rest architectures are where the neural architecture search happens. So we put multiple convolutional layers in in some groups. So if you can see multiple arrows that are located closely to each other, they are they are located in uh, in the same group. So for example, in the third layer here, we have four convolutional we have four convolutional operations, and then the next layer we have like eight, and then we have four, eight, etc. And uh, in this software architecture, we also found that by adding a skip connection, it increases the accuracy as well. So how does that work? So we, so we choose this uh, super architecture. We collect multiple convolutional layer into several groups. And during the inference and training, only one convolutional layer per group can be chosen. So initially, we assign some probability of being chosen per members in each group. So for example, in initially, we assign like a quarter probability of each member being chosen. So it has uniform distribution of being chosen. And then during the training, we perform two update steps learning. The, the first step, we choose one member based on their probability distribution, probability of being chosen per group, and propagate the, inform propagate the input forward to the output, calculate the loss function, and then propagate back the gradient, and then update the weights of the chosen operators based on the gradients. So that's uh, the step one, to update the weights of chosen operators with supervised learning. And then the second step is we test with uh, we sample multiple architectures, for example, uh, top and bottom architecture that you can see here, and then we calculate the loss function for each for each architectures. We rank them, and then we update the probability of being chosen based on their rankings. So, for example. If the bottom architecture here has lower loss function, then it will be more, we, we will increase the probability of being chosen of the operators in the bottom architecture here. And the top architecture, we will reduce the probability of being chosen. So in by alternating step one and step two many times, we can end, we will end up with trained weights of each convolutional neural networks and the trained probability distribution. So we know what configuration works best for that given problems. So the advantage of using of doing the second step here is that it can also it find a good architecture by penalizing the architecture that gives low uh, higher loss function. And it also acts as a regularizer. So by, so by turning it off and turning it on some operation, it works some kind of uh, it works kind of like a dropout, but it works for operation level instead of uh, neuron levels. And it also gets us the right level of complexity for a given problem. So if the so if the problem is complex that it will then it will tend to have more complex architecture and if it's simpler then it will tend to have a uh, simpler or more probabilistic ar architectures so we apply these techniques in 10 real science cases so so we collected 10 test cases from 
from our collaborators from all over Oxford and from several universities in our collaborations. And all of them has scalar inputs with varied number of input parameters. The lowest one is three and the highest number of input parameters are 14. And they have various types of outputs. So we have one dimensional output of the simulation. For example, these are spectrum, spectrum of light. These are our outputs. And we also have cases where we have two dimensional or image output, and we also have scalar outputs. And it varies from one to 45 channels of the output. And the number of test data set, number of data set that we collected, we generated using simulations, also varies from as much as 14,000, because this is relatively cheaper simulations. So we can afford to generate of 14,000 to 39 simulations data set. This is the most expensive cases. Uh, so we can only generate 39. And also the second lowest is about 410. So yeah, these test cases also have various various running time. So the uh, cheapest one actually runs in five seconds. So the simulation runs in five seconds. And the most expensive one runs in about 1,000 CPU hours. So from this data set that we generated, we split it into 50% for the training, for the step one, update and 21% for validation to update the probability distribution for step two. And 28% is for presenting the results in this presentation and in the paper. So we don't use the test data set here during the training at all. And we also optimize the hyperparameters to obtain the best validation for uh, second test cases, which is OTS. And then we use the same hyperparameters for all other cases. So this is the results for a simulation with zero dimensional output. So you can see the orange dots here represents the output from the emulators. The X axis is true values and the Y axis is the predicted values from the emulators. So we can get R square correlations about triple, 0.99 which is pretty good, I think. And this is the results. This is an example of results from X-ray emission spectroscopy, where it has 10 input parameters describing the system, and it outputs one dimensional of spectrum. So you can see the blue line shows the simulated spectrum, and the orange line shows the simulated em uh, shows the output from the emulators and this is the results from uh two dimensional simulations so we have three input parameters and the it we it outputs 12 images or two dimensional outputs so you can see on the left hand side is the output from simulations and the right hand side is the output from the emulator. So we can see the output is very similar to the simulations. And this is the results for from all the simulations that we tested in this work. So we have uh, two dimensional simulations here. On the left hand side, we have various one dimensional simulations and zero D simulations in ICF jack scalars. So it looks pretty good overall. And we also compare it with other types of machine learning, mostly based on scikit-learn, scikit-learn uh, models, because this is where most people in science or physics build their emulator with. So. On the blue line here is our loss function using dense using our method, and we can see we we can see that we achieved the loss function, the loss loss function, 
compared to the uh, compared to other scikit learns method. And interestingly, for ICF Jack and ICF Jack scholars, we took the data set from Lawrence Livermore lab, where they also published their own models to produce uh, to produce the emulator. And their model is on the red on the red line here. So we, we can also beat their models as well using the using a general method of this neural architecture search. And just to remind you that the hyperparameters here are only optimized for OTS, and we applied the same hyperparameters for others. And this is also interesting uh, because many people ask about overfitting on GCM, where the simulation we only have 39 data sets. So we can see that. Uh, so this is the training loss, validation, and test loss using dense and other methods only for 39 training data sets. So we actually multiply 39, copy it to have. Uh, 10,000 data sets. So basically only 39 unique values, but we copy it to reach like 10,000. And by applying dense, we can see the validation and test loss here. We, we achieved the lowest validation and test loss. And the difference between validation and test is not as big as the other methods. As you can see, for example, in SVR, the validation have much lower loss function than the test lost. And especially on Gaussian processes and gradient boosting regressors, where the training has much, much lower uh, loss function than validation and test loss. So we achieve, so we can minimize the effect of overfitting as well here. As you can see by achieving small difference between validation and test loss. So it also have uh, one of the one of the last point that we realized before we submit the paper is that this operation, the step to update, where we try different architectures, can actually be seen as a special case of dropout. So just by adapting the theorem from Yaringal et al we can achieve, uh, we can obtain the uncertainty for actually for uh, minimal cost. So after the training, we just sample the architectures, uh, we just sample the architecture and produce the output from using different architectures and we can get the uncertainty. So you can see here, uh, it shows us the regions with high uncertainty at the middle. And it also shows us the region with low uncertainty at the right hand side. So it, it tells you as well which region they are most uncertain and which region they are most certain. And we also use this emulator to perform inverse problems. So this is very common in physics. And I think it's also very common in other uh science scientific fields so where we have a systems with some parameters and we want we are interested in measuring that parameters the way that we measure it is by observing other types of uh variables or other types of uh parameters which we call observables so for example in sun's case we want to know what is the density and the core of the sun because we can't measure it because we cannot measure it directly, what we do is we only infer it from what we see. So that's kind of inverse problem. So in solving the inverse problem, we use we are usually helped by simulations. So we know the physical parameters. For example, we know the density in the core of the sun. We can simulate the dynamics of that given the parameters, and we can simulate what is the uh, what are the parameters that we can observe? For example, the brightness of the sun, the activities of the sun, the and all other things that we can observe. We can simulate that, and by matching the observations with simulations, 
then we got the parameters that we want from the observations. So we also, so that's the inverse problem. So we want to know if this emulator that we built is accurate to substitute the simulations in helping us solving the inverse problem. So for example, in this spectroscopy case, we have uh, system parameters, for example, like the temperature, the mass, and radius, etc. But the only thing that we can measure is, is the spectrum, is the spectrum from that system. So on the right hand side here, you can see the black dashed line is the spectrum that we measure on the from the experiment. And we want to generate all the parameters that match uh, these observations. So on the left hand side, you can see the scatter plot, the blue scatter plot, the second row, are the parameters obtained using simulations. So these are the parameters that match the observations uh, using the simulations. And then we substitute the simulation with the emulators, see if we can retrieve the similar scatter plot. So the orange scatter plot here is the are the parameters that the emulator thinks matches the experimental data. So you can see they are very similar. The distribution are very similar. The difference is to obtain the these blue lines, uh, the, to obtain the, these blue plots, it took us around three weeks. And to obtain these orange dots, it only took us uh, less than a minute using emulators. And interestingly, the whole pipeline from generating data set to uh, training emulators and generating this scatter plot only took us three days. So it's shorter to use dense to generate data set, train deep neural ne network, and uh, generate the scatter plot using emulators rather than generating this scatter plot using simulations. So it's order of like seven times faster. So in conclusion, we have tested dance on 10 real sci scientific simulation cases to learn input to output mapping, and it works very well. And the accuracy that's achieved by our method is significantly higher than other techniques that we compare that we compared here. And we can also get uncertainty quantifications, and it works well with limited training data. And I think that's so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Uh, this was a really, really interesting talk. A um, lot of uh, interesting ideas that you presented. And uh, we have a few questions from our audience. Uh, we would uh, take uh, them in the order that they were asked. Like, um, so one of the, uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, attendees is asking, why are we using the neural architecture search here? Uh, I think it relates to slide number 10, 11 for you. Um, so just wondering, um, you know, what is the, um, what, what, what is the idea behind that? Is it to find the best uh, hyperparameters or best number of layers? Uh, sorry, uh, could you go uh, one back, like where the architecture was there? Uh, yeah, this one, yeah, the two step, like where you were trying to, uh, sorry, slide seven. So where yeah. you were trying to kind of like, you know, determine uh, assigning probabilities to all these different layers. So the question is, why are we using the neural architecture search here? Um, uh, uh, I mean, what is the, uh, you know, could you please comment on that a little bit more? Okay, so the idea of this deep neural architecture is to, uh, so the main objective of this project is to build uh, a way to train emulator that works on a wide range of cases. So if you have only one cases, then probably finding a good architectures, finding a good architecture, finding the best architecture for that, and then stick with that is probably a better idea. But if you don't know where to start, uh, mm -hmm. if you don't know what kind of architecture that you want to start with, 
or you want to work with different kind of uh, simulations, then it's better to use like neural architecture search. So because this is also the uh, the motivations from that, and sure. so uh, different simulations have different complexities. So for example, in in uh, in our GCM simulation, in one of our test cases, the sensitivity of the parameters is very low, which means that if you change the parameters, the output doesn't change very much. As opposed sure. to other simulations, for example, like X-ray emission spectroscopy, where you change the parameters, the output change quite uh, completely. So there are two simulations with two different complexities. And if we put like a very complex architecture, it will most likely to overfit the GCM cases. So we want to know, we want to find the architecture that, ta that is tailored to the complexity level of uh, each problems. And we found that this is the good one. So uh, how, what would you comment on the cost of training? Um, because it perhaps seems that for every new problem, you'll have to do this again and again. Uh, and what bigger parameter space are you looking for in each problem? Because, um, uh, for example, like you know, for the GCM, uh, you're looking at uh, some particular inputs mapping to some particular outputs. But um, is is uh, how like like what, what what regime were you looking at in terms of the GCM? Uh, what kind of physics were you trying to like uh, you know specifically model using that? Could you please comment on the comment on these two things, please? So the uh, range of parameters that we try to model va actually varies. And typically we set the parameters that captures the region that we want. And we found that in some cases that parameters is actually small, which means that uh, there are not a lot, of, there are quite l small variations in that regime. For example, in the atmospheric simulations, even though we, we simulate, uh, we simulate the activity by a factor of uh, half and two and a third and three times higher. We mm -hmm. found that the uh, sensitivity of that is quite small, but there's also okay. one simulation, for example, this one, the X-ray emission spectroscopy. We choose the parameter, we unintentionally choose the parameters that is actually quite wide. So you can see a lot of shapes of spectrum in that uh, parameter space. So yeah, I think the parameter space was the cho the choice of parameter space was motivated from our sense of uh, useful parameter regions. Mm -hmm. But okay. we didn't know it beforehand if it if it's too big or too too small. We just know it after we train it. Sure, interesting. So some of the questions that uh, you know we see from the uh, audience is that uh, uh, you know since we are on this topic uh, for slide number seven, if you could uh, you know move there, uh, the okay. question is that is the neural architecture search or the sample candidate does neural architecture search generated um, uh, for slide number seven? If you could, uh, yeah, yeah, here uh, it says that the um, is, is this the neural architecture search or is it the sample candidate for the neural architecture search generated? Like, is this, is this, um, is this what you get after you are done with it? Or is it, you know, the entire range of candidates that you have? Like, oh, so this is kind of like, Oh, so this is, uh, so the type of architecture search that we use is actually the efficient architecture search, efficient neural architecture okay. search, where we start from mm -hmm. super architecture and we put all our, uh, all candidates of convolution of operators in our super architectures and then uh, algorithmically we choose the best configuration from that so and sure, this yeah and this is like the type of a super architecture that we found uh works best for the ots case so I only work for one case at the beginning to find the best architecture and hyperparameters, and then apply it to the sure. apply the same rules to other cases. Sure, great. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, commenting on that. So um, 
one one uh, a few of the questions are about uh, can can uh, you know our audience access the data sets is it publicly available so we will uh so it's currently under review in in a mm -hmm. journal and we will sure. release the data set and the code oh perfect yeah that was the next question uh folks wanted to uh because you know this is a pretty interesting work i think a lot of folks would uh you know find a use case uh you know uh, for for using some or something like this so yeah, yeah uh that's great news that you will uh, share your code uh, good luck with the review process so yeah. um uh, and 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 the one question from the audience was uh you know do you uh, think that these emulators are uh something that could be uh you know could could replace actual physics simulation or what or do you think these could augment a physics simulation to kind of do the sensitivity analysis the inverse problems that you have, you have mentioned in your in your talk yeah so it, it depends on actually what you want to use the simulation for uh in our sure. cases we use simulations mostly for inverse problem or answer uh, yeah. or sensitivity analysis so yes we actually have substituted our simulations with emulators <laughs> but if you want to know for example like the details of the dynamics of that simulations then the simulator cannot provide that at all mm, interesting yeah, so we actually have, so uh yeah we actually have replaced some of our simulations in our daily work with this emulator. So, so, uh, so, what kind of problems you would, uh, you know, uh, and we were talking about this before the, you know, we went live, and we were commenting on that, you know, um, uh, does chaotic like problems that exhibit chaotic nature are a good candidate for this, or problems that have very deterministic uh, kind of um, uh, solutions are, are 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 better for this? Like, what is your kind of like? overview to this idea to this so, you know, framework yeah so it actually actually the performance of these uh the performance of this emulator depends quite a lot on the shape of uh, how do you say it the observation space the yeah yeah so for example in mm -hmm. uh or maybe like the sensitivity to the parameters. So if the sense, so if you change the parameters slightly and the output doesn't change very much, then it will mm -hmm. works quite well. But if you change the parameters slightly and the uh, output change pretty much, quite a lot, then it tends to works not as good. So for example, in uh, so GCM, as you can see here, GCM are cases yeah. where the sensitivity is quite low the xrts halo are very quite low the one that ha has quite high sensitivity is act for example like x-ray emission spectroscopy xes here and the size tomo mm -hmm. so you can see a lot of variations of the outputs uh from the data sets so you can you can also see it for example in the halo and xrts here it almost perfectly matched the simulation output because they have like a low sensitivity and while in the xcs it misses slightly it misses some of the bit because in this case it uh it has a very high sensitivity uh with respect to the parameters Interesting. So, so, um, so that's that's like a very interesting point where uh, you know one could use this framework for problems that sh exhibit uh, uh, you know low sensitivity to inputs. So, so one follow-up question to that is how does one get away you know from uh, from this problem? Does it um, does it uh, really help if you have some physics information? Like I, I know you talked about regularizers and stuff like that. Uh, so does it help to embed, uh, you know, some physics information in the loss functions, or have some layers, uh, you know, uh, that can, uh, you know, um, uh, that that can uh, enforce some physics constraints? For example, in uh, in the GCM models, there are energy constraints and stuff like that. So, so do you think that could be one approach to get away from the sensitivity uh, problem, where, uh, you know, that you see in the FPS uh, kind of kind of uh, uh, scenarios? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this is like. Uh, this is just for, I mean, the architecture for a general 
cases for a wide range of cases. So if you want to work on a specific case, then you can encode what you believe on that simulations into the architecture. Sure. But it could be like a starting point uh, of your emulators if you want to build an emulator. Sure. Yeah, this is uh, this is very interesting. So uh, before uh, uh, you know, I have a few more questions from my end. One was that um, what how could you comment on the training time? Could you comment on the resources that you use? Just so that our audience can know if it's doable, like you know, um, if it's like takes like you know twenty v one hundred kind of like already puts a lot of people out of the uh, you know prospect of doing this. Uh, so so what kind of GPUs did you use? How many did you use? What was oh, the yeah. training time and stuff like that? That's a good question, actually. So one of the reason why we choose the efficient neural architecture search, why we use this schematic instead of like the full neural architecture set is because we are quite limited on the resources. So we are oh. we are mostly on uh, physics group. So we don't we didn't really invest on GPU. The only GPU that we had uh -huh. was uh, Titan X GPU. So it was it was about okay. like one one thousand dollars or one thousand pounds. So that's the mm -hmm. G, the only GPU we used for uh, for this project. For the training time, it actually varies depending on the simulations output. So for one dimensional so, simulation output, it took us around eight hours, eight hours to train. For zero D, it's even cheap, it's even faster. It was around like one or two hours. But for two so, D, for example, like the, the most expensive one was SMOPS simulation here, the oceanic simulation where uh -huh. it took me around like two or three days to finish this uh, training. But that was, I mean, that was fine because all the tuning was done for one dimensional cases, which is done in like eight hours. So we can tune it with, uh, so I tune it with cheap cases first and then apply it for, uh, much more expensive cases, and it turns out to work well. Interesting. That's 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 great news. Um, so I had another question about slide number seventeen, uh, where you kind of show the performance of this against exactly this one. So uh, seventeen. I'm sorry, the one before. Oh, sorry. No. So there's no seventeen. Yeah. I I actually hide the slide. Oh. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Sixteen. I'm, 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 okay. Sorry. My bad. So sixteen. Um, so here, uh, you know, uh, we definitely see uh, a, a marked difference between the performance of your framework versus some of the more canonical ones. Uh, I'm just curious, um, you know, because your framework kind of does a pretty big loop of uh, finding the best architecture, finding the best hyperparameters. Um, yeah. Did you did you kind of get that uh, for the other um, other kind of uh, models as well, or did you? Uh, I mean, what was your uh, workflow like for the other kind of like when you're comparing the data set, was it uh, did you optimize them as well or or uh, you know what did you do? So I actually so in the so for other parameters I just uh, choose the default so I just choose the default one but okay. I increase the number of uh, for example a random forest I increase the number of ensemble into like one hundred ensemble. Mm -hmm. So it's just like uh, the same setup for everything and the same setup for that. It probably, it's probably uh, not a really fair comparison because one is deep learning and the other is non-deep learning. But this sure. is like the best comparison that we can have because uh, it's, quick, yeah. it's not a lot of work in yeah, doing yeah. the yeah wide range of emulate wide yeah wide range of case simulators in this field. Sure, sure. That sounds uh, that sounds interesting. So um, one uh, you know one question I, I personally had because I'm kind of trying to do something like this for my research is um, so 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 if somebody's trying to build an emulator uh, uh, for any physical processes, um, what what would you like to kind of like you know mentioned to them in terms of like what to look out for from your experience uh you know um uh, uh like like what was your experience like in building this uh, robust approach 
uh, would you uh, are there any particular things that one should focus on like do you think is um, you know uh, creating uh, is focusing on the network more important uh, or, or focusing network architecture i mean or focusing on the hyper parameters what is your kind of like um, you know um, uh, take away from this what would you like to give uh, to the so, community so some uh some of my finding was actually this this skip fun this skip network skip layer actually improved quite a lot like quite okay. i can't remember the number but it uh, it improves quite a, by quite a lot uh adding more layers it improves slightly but it's it makes it more expensive as well so there's a trade off there but the uh one bad, much better improvement is to put like skip layers, but the yeah skip layers here, and the the one thing that I forgot to mention is actually there's a multiplication constant uh, in this group. So for example, I, I I assign like alpha one in this skip layer and alpha two in in the group, and that's also trainable. Mm -hmm. So that's. Uh so that also that that improves the performance quite a lot and the hyper the hyper parameters uh so what i had in mind is that if i have the best configurations how can i add more hyper parameters so that the current uh the current best performance is actually a special special case of that hyper parameters so mm -hmm. yeah i expand the model uh using that way so from one best model i add one hyper parameters uh to allow more variations and then by the end of the day i just optimize it using like cmas optimizing Very the hyper parameters using cmas that and that also works really well pretty cool pretty cool so um before we uh you know close uh, one final thought what is the future of this project where do you see this going ahead what are the next set of problems you're looking for so that we can you know um set a reminder of for your google scholar uh and, and you know wait for your new papers what are what are you doing up uh, next so we are doing so this is like a general case of emulators and so, so we are thinking of going into like one specific case in our field mm -hmm. which is like quantum physics or yeah quantum physics and sort of like plasma physics so sure. we also we want to build the specialized emulator in that field and the for the the general di direction for the general emulator is pro it's more interesting to see uh the development in active learning type of things so we also had we okay. all, we had like a preliminary studies last year with uh one of our summer students and it shows quite prom promising results so we can reduce the number of samples by a factor of 10 without losing the accuracy wow. so wow. that's also one interesting that's, that's direction amazing. Mm -hmm. oh that's very interesting um yeah so so thank you so much Mohammed. i think i think um thank you we really enjoyed it talk this was this was really really good uh, a lot of new ideas a lot of new um discussions about um you know how to build this these kind of setups um so uh, uh thanks Mohammed, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us uh and if you want to see more talks like this please visit the uh ace website ai.science and um uh, and, and log in to access slides and, and any other sessions. Also, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about the upcoming event. Thank you so much. Stay safe, and we look forward to hosting you at a future event soon. Take care. Thank you.